Buenas tardes. Me llamo Dr. Peek. Uh, soy Giorgiano uh, Corazón Niños de los Estados Unidos. Perdóname que no hable español. Entonces, I've no financial disclosures. Um, this is a difficult talk, um, my vision for the future, because whatever my vision is, um, it may ha have not much effect on actually what happens. So I look for sources of data about the future. Um, and um, <clears throat> I was somewhat successful. So hopefully um, uh, you'll see in 31 years uh, what comes to pass. <clears throat> so in 2050, um, I hope to be 84 years old. Um, so in terms of predicting the future, it helps to look backwards 31 years. So I managed to dig out some photos, not digital photos, of me um, uh, canoe racing 31 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and to put it into perspective, I was 22 years old. It's going to be one year before the first patient receives ECMO in Leicester. It'll be two years before I graduate from medical school. It'll be four years before I'm involved in a discussion uh, about the use of ECMO. It was at the Brompton Hospital. Uh, for the first time, and then we decided um, it was a useless therapy because of the, um, uh, our, the um, uh, NIH study. In six years, I've seen my first patient on ECMO, and there were 69 papers published uh, about ECMO that year. It was the year, obviously, uh, before ELSO uh, was um, uh, inaugurated. So one of the um, most useful papers published um, um, in 1988 um, was a meeting um, about adult extracorporeal membrane, membrane oxygenation and you recognize some of these people um, in this picture and um, there's this other guy who keeps cropping up <laughs> so we can learn that um, there was a lot of ECMO being done 115 patients had uh, extracorporeal CO2 removal um, in the world, one in Christchurch who died, sadly, uh, four in Salt Lake with a 50% survival. <clears throat> there was worry about bleeding. So this is a paper about surface heparinization. And these graphs are individual patients. So people are looking at individual patients uh, and trying to work out um, what to do. <clears throat> The whole experience in one of the most experienced centers at Penn State, six individual patients listed. So what were the problems that ecmologists were facing in 1988? Well, case selection, who is going to survive, who is not going to survive, how to prevent and deal with bleeding, and um, they were dealing on a daily basis with ventilator-induced lung injury. So not much different from what we have to do today. Nowadays, of course, we also have to worry about organisation of our services. Do we have regionalisation like we have in the UK? Do we have complete chaos like we have in the United States? Do we have a hub and spoke uh, distribution? So organisation of our services is really important. When you look into the future, you have to decide whether you have a dystopian view like portrayed in Blade Runner and... Um, uh, at the bottom um, in Westworld, or whether it's slightly more optimistic um, and whether man will be colonizing the solar system. So I'm going to be slightly realistic, so optimistic but with some, um, some caveats. So what do you think the solutions are in 2050? Well, I think we're going to be dealing with case selection. I think there might be problems with bleeding. I think ventilator-induced lung injury hopefully will be solved. Um, and I definitely think there will be um, some changes in organisation. I think we can see those changes happening already. <clears throat> so case selection for uh, patients who might be helped by ECMO depends on whether they have potentially reversible disease. And potentially reversible disease depends on what treatments we have available. So it may be that if we can bridge patients to transplant, for instance, um, that what becomes an irreversible disease becomes reversible. And obviously, we may be able to solve the issue about donor organs, and we might be able to solve long-term issues about transplantation, obviously, particularly transplantation of the lung, 
um, is not entirely, um, obviously, a fantastic treatment in terms of long-term um, uh, survivability. Maybe that gene therapy is going to change um, which patients are suitable for ECMO. So we may be putting on lots of patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin um, deficiency, and then they get their gene therapy. It may be that genes are identified um, that cause or uh, modify many other diseases. It's quite likely that the pharmaceutical industry um, will introduce disease-modifying drugs, particularly for common diseases that they can sell a lot of. So I would expect that patients with COPD um, and other common adult diseases um, will be targets for those things. But what about antibiotic resistance? We're already seeing all kinds of antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria and um, antifungal resistant fungi. It may be that ECMO becomes a tool that we can use um, to give 1950s style therapy like uh, plombage of the chest to uh, treat tuberculosis. Or it may be that uh, antibiotic resistance becomes such a big problem that um, we can't do um, any of our invasive treatments at all. So what about bleeding? Well, fortunately, the uh, proprietary ANIC coating will have eliminated surface activation of the coagulation cascade, platelets, complement leukocytes, and fibrinolysis. So our ECMO circuits remain pristine for the entire, um, entire run. But the patient still has a role to play. So inflammation and procoagulant states due to underlying disease um, probably still means we're going to have to give some kind of um, um, anticoagulant, even if it's um, extremely low-dose um, direct thrombin inhibitor. NH Industries is listed as the system's third richest company after Tesla and the Jupiter Mining Corporation. Is Dr. Anich in the room? So what about ventilator-induced lung injury? Well... <coughs> Fortunately, ventilators have been largely eliminated from uh, ICUs where patients are treated with ARDS, apart from two obscure religious sects um, uh, which still function in Baltimore and Salt Lake City. Um, wearable respiratory assist devices, or RADs, are widely available. And that completely changes the paradigm, particularly for chronic uh, respiratory illnesses. Unfortunately, the young practicing RAD doctors can't understand why old people think it's really funny to keep saying, it's rad, dude. <laughs> We're going to have new technology to help us. We're going to have ultrasound guided cannulation robots that can hit the vein every time. We're going to have self-priming circuits. We're going to have auto-regulated RPM and sweep gas um, so that the uh, patient's extracorporeal support is adjusted to the patient's needs. Unfortunately, the only thing that um, the ecmologist still has to do is to connect the circuit because they haven't yet worked out a robot that can actually make an airless connection uh, in real time. And the control panel on these new uh, ECMO pumps is going to be very simple. <laughs> Organisation. Now, here we are, an ECMO society, uh, people from all different kinds of um, medical backgrounds, um, and here we are all together. ECMO and respiratory assist devices are now going to be part of the intensive care paradigm, and I think that um, that's going to change the way that our societies work, because the normal intensive care societies and cardiac surgery societies and... Um, uh, societies for um, emergency medical technicians are going to be dealing with this stuff on a daily basis. I think that this technology is going to be available in every ICU, most emergency departments, and even in many ambulance systems. So it's going to be immediately available um, for patients. Unfortunately, though, uh, HLA match 3D printed lung transplantation is only going to be available in Ann Arbor, Regensburg, Gainesville, and Bangalore, where it will be much cheaper than the rest of the world. <laughs> we're going to have new problems to deal with in 2050. If we're going to be using uh, extracorporeal support for patients, um, they're going to keep coming back if their disease isn't treated. So recannulation is going to become um, a real art. 
multidisciplinary team meetings are now so big and take so long that decubitai um, will become a recognised occupational hazard. And electronic me medical records will now occupy up to five-eighths of the solar system's combined computer memory. So thank you very much for your attention.